But hello, everyone. I'm the reviewer. I travel through time and space to review Doctor Who. Now, some people say that's a big waste of time because I could just wait for the BBC to air the episodes, but now the next episode of Doctor Who is in for a year, so who's laughing now? <laughs> that's right, one year. Now, I... <coughs> Watch, watch the language translating! Uh, 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 my giddy aunt! Uh, uh. 25! Now, some people say I'm a cheap ripoff of Patrick Troughton's Doctor, but that's not true. I'm actually a very bad ripoff of John Pertwee's Doctor. Thank you. <laughs>Uh, normally I'm in time and space reviewing these episodes, but uh, I've prepared a fascinating scientific discovery here for you today. Let's see if I can connect us to the time-space stream. Hello, enemy Midwest! Oh dear. Oh, how can there be two of me? It's very simple. You must have arrived before I left. Best not tempt the Blinovich limitation effect. Why not let me handle the review? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm also the reviewer, and with me as always is my cameraman, Jamie. Oi, two reviewers? Hey, does that mean there are two Jamies out there? I shudder to think at that possibility, Jamie. <clears throat> as I'm currently in December 2015, and Anime Midwest occupies July 2016, why not kill two birds with one stone and <clears throat> celebrate Christmas in July? This is The Husbands of River Song. On a cold, snowy world during Christmas, a funny little man walks up to the TARDIS. He knocks, and the doctor answers, antlers and all. Yes, he is a surgeon, sort of, and they're off. Nardole takes him to a crashed spaceship. They're greeted by a woman in furs. River Song, but don't they dare use her real name. He recognizes her, but she fails to recognize him. Anyway, they need to get moving. River's husband is dying. Her husband, guarded by monks and observed by four billion worshippers, is wearing a giant red battle suit, King Hydroflax, which admittedly surprises the doctor. While the doctor can't stop crossing his arms over his disapproval of this relationship, River comforts the dying king. She's brought him the finest surgeon in the universe. Of course, that's not the doctor, much to Nardole's panic. Although the doctor upsets Hydroflax with his cracks about royalty being useless, River calms him and takes the doctor aside. Look at me. Why? I'm the doctor. You better be. You've got an operation to perform. There's a bullet in his head, but the bullet is actually a diamond, the most valuable diamond in the universe, lodged there after an unfortunate explosion. River has been hired to get it back. That's why she married the king, and that's why she wants to chop his head off and take it, diamond and all. The doctor's shocked by how cavalier River is discussing the king's murder, but he's a despot and cannibal. His death is no big loss. However, Hydroflex has heard everything. If she wants his head, she can have it. And he unscrews his head from its robotic body. River tells him she's the archaeologist who's going to take back everything he's taken from the good people of this universe. River pulls out a trowel, I'm sorry, a sonic trowel, and blasts the warrior monks. <laughs> this is getting ridiculous! It's getting so you can put the word sonic in front of anything and make it sound like a space age tool. It's true, uh, I have a sonic spatula. No, I said spatula, it's been small. And I, in fact, am sitting on a sonic couch. Uh, I'd rather enjoy that, I'll have to try that again once the cameras are off. <coughs> uh, what about you, Jamie? Well, I've got a sonic Zoe. Zoe? Aye, that's when I named my sonic dildo. Oh, Jamie! Jamie! Haha, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not actually sonic. Hydroflex's body attacks, but stops when the doctor threatens to throw the king's head in the garbage disposal. It ignores the king's orders as self-destructive and shuts down. They teleport out and land a foot or so above the ground. As Hydroflex's head shouts threats, the doctor can't help but laugh at the ridiculousness of this situation. River still doesn't know who the doctor is and proves it by kissing her pilot, Ramon, her other husband. She's found the capsule, but can't locate Damsel, which, the doctor learns, is her codename for him, because he needs regular rescuing. River knows that the Doctor is on this planet, that's why she crashed Hydroflex's ship here. However, Ramon has been unable to locate anyone with any 12 of the Doctor's faces. The Doctor finally understands. She doesn't know about his new regeneration cycle. Back at the ship, the body interrogates Nardole. 
He knows where River is, and the most efficient way to get that knowledge is to upload him. The chassis beheads him and plugs Nardole into itself before flying off. Hmm. It's as if someone took the head off a knuckle festa doll and put it on a Buzz Lightyear action figure. To infinity and beyond. Mail TV! For all the power of the Time Lords, there is one foe we dare not provoke. The Disney Corporation. There's no beating them. Look at the X-Men. They can't wait for Damsel. They head to the TARDIS. They need time travel, so she'll just steal the TARDIS. The Doctor is aghast, but it's okay. She can take it and then just bring it back to the moment they left. He'll never know it was gone. Yes, he will. How? He'll just know. Well, he's never noticed before. She warns him that the TARDIS isn't as small as it looks. Finally. Finally. It's my go. He makes a massive show over how big it is on the inside. He just wanted to see it done properly once. The head, although shut down, is emitting a signal. They try to leave, but the TARDIS won't take off. The doctor theorizes the machine won't leave because Hydroflex's body is not on board while his head is, so technically he's both in and out of the TARDIS. Ramon is heading back to his ship when he hears Nardole crying. He's pointing a gun at his head, sort of. Hydroflex reactivates and warns them. If he dies, his body will destroy the planet. They hear Ramon outside, but the body kicks the doors in. He's now attached to it. It attacks, and the Doctor closes the door, causing the TARDIS to take off. River and the Doctor then run from the TARDIS into a very elegant drawing room full of aliens aboard a space yacht. River is greeted by Fleming, the head steward, and gets him to seal up the baggage hold. With a quick spritz, River is in an evening gown, and they head to the restaurant. This ship is filled with tyrants and murderers on vacation. They'll sell the diamond to one of these vacationers. River explains that it was easy to trick Hydroflax into marrying her. As she reads a certain diary, she tells the doctor that men like to believe they're the hero of any story they're in. He notices she looks sad while reading the book. It's because the diary is almost full, and she wonders if that's because the man who gave it to her knew exactly how long it would need to be. Ramon has contacted Fleming, who decides to see what's going on in the baggage hold. At dinner, they're joined by a scarred man named Scratch, who wants to buy the diamond. He proceeds to pull his head apart take out an orb, and then reseal it. His head, that is, not the orb. The orb will transfer all the money promised to River to her account. When he gets paranoid, River promises him that they're safe. This is a public place. However, he informs her this is not a public place, and we see the other diners bear the same scar. They have the diamond, and they do so for their great king, Hydroflax. River quickly zips up the bag as Fleming begs for his life. He knows who River is truly married to and can get that body the best head in the universe. Panicking, the doctor reveals the severed head of Hydroflax to his followers and offers to sell to the king's most devout servant before turning him back on. They all bow, and River and the doctor try to leave when Fleming and the body come marching in. The body scans Hydroflax. The diamond bullet is continuing to move. He'll be dead in seven minutes. Hydroflax orders the body to save him, and it decides the best way to save him is to get a new head. It disintegrates Hydroflax. Fleming explains that the diary of River Song will lead them to the doctor. The body brings up Nardole to confirm this before sending him back down. I can think of few things less appealing than seeing a sweaty, <coughs> discombobulated Matt Lucas trying to catch his breath. Uh, <laughs> it's like catching the tail end of a Three Stooges porno. <laughs> My Mo haircut. Mo, that's an anime term, right? But River says the doctor isn't coming because he never loved her, and the body confirms she's telling the truth. She loves him, but the Doctor just isn't capable of loving her back. He's too big, too great to fall in love. That's much too ordinary for the Doctor. Loving the Doctor is like loving a concept or other abstract. He's not here. The Doctor is not stupid enough or sentimental enough, and he is certainly not in love enough to find himself standing in it with me! Clock strikes two, and River explains that in the event of a meteor strike, the safest place on this ship is right where they're standing. She didn't choose this ship by accident. She traveled back in time here after learning why it crashed. The meteor hits, and they fall through the floor. He explains his new body, and she catches the diamond in her decolletage. The body files determined to take the doctor's head. River goes to stabilize the ship as the doctor catches the credit sphere. He offers the body unlimited funds and plugs it in. 
but all the banks it's connected to have firewalls and antivirals. They erase the body's programming. He joins River, and they're both a bit miffed over the other people their spouse has married through the years. River recognizes the planet they're about to crash on. Darillion, home of the Singing Towers. The doctor was supposed to take her here, but kept canceling. He teleports River back to the TARDIS, and she in turn lands the TARDIS around him, and they take cover inside just as the ship crashes, and they get tossed around a bit. The doctor comes to first. He heads out and sees the Singing Towers. A worker is there trying to see if anyone survived the crash, but no one did. The doctor is impressed and tells him that this would be a good place for a restaurant before giving him River's Diamond. He then moves forward in time. The restaurant is there, but they're booked up for the next four years. No problem. River exits the TARDIS and is shown to her table. She finds Ramon there in the King's body. The doctor rescued him from the crash and he works here now. Nardole is still down there somewhere. The doctor arrives and gives her a Christmas present. It's a sonic screwdriver. How lovely. When I saw the sonic chart, I thought it was just embarrassing. <laughs> the singing towers are amazing. And she sees the doctor crying. Remembering that her diary is almost full, she's worried. The history books that she's read suggest this might be the final time the Doctor and River are together. He explains you can't avoid the future forever. People don't get happy ever after, but River explains that happy ever after only means a little bit of time set aside with the ones you love. The Doctor explains the two towers are a mystery. No one knows why they sing, but when you put the two of them together, when you need it the most, there is a song. This is their last night together, but on Darillion, night lasts 24 years. And so we've come full circle with River. There's nothing left for her now but to join the Tenth Doctor in that planet-wide library. But, but, is this everything we could want from River Song's final appearance? Let's take a closer look and find out. This was a funny story. Not that what happened was funny, but more that it was full of funny performances, funny characters. Although there is a massive tonal change in the last, let's say, fifth of the story. I'm not sure if that's too late for such a major switch in tone. Overall, I think it all worked out. The story itself is kind of a runaway adventure with the Doctor and the companion role to River. For once, he's being dragged through time and space with no clue as to what's going on. It's a little similar to the story Time Heist in that there's a caper being pulled at the same time. As for the characters, Peter Capaldi is having fun with this role. The highlight being when after all this time, he gets to do the bigger on the inside reaction. He doesn't need to do it, but it suits the 12th ego and sense of occasion to make a speech for River's benefit, or even just to get it done right, as he says. He also plays these nice little moments of shock and surprise upon finding out River has other husbands and has stolen the TARDIS on occasion, and generally speaking, can be a little horrible at times. River, played once again by Alex Kingston, is the real star of this episode. She's having a lot of fun ripping off the bad guys, but is a bit cavalier for my taste when she talks about murdering someone, even if he is a horrible killer. Also, I wasn't really crazy about her knowing that her character's time might be up, because that should have been an ongoing concern for her in Silence at the Library, other than at the very end when she refers to these events. I think it would have been more tragic if only the Doctor knew River's End was coming. As for the sporting cast, Ramon seemed pointless other than pouring salt on the wound for the Doctor. Nardo was funny, but then how could Matt Lucas not be? We never got much backstory for either man, although since Nardo will be back next year, I suppose that's coming. The bad guys were on the gamut of stereotypical villains, the power-mad tyrant, a.k.a. Doctor Doom. The strong, silent brute, a.k.a. Juggernaut. The crazy zealot, a.k.a. Apocalypse. And finally, the polite, cultured monster, a.k.a. Lex Luthor. The ending is emotional. We've come to the second to last moment of River's life. She's got nowhere left to go but the library where the Tenth Doctor is waiting. There's a lot of beauty and meaningful moments between the Doctor and River. Things are implied that don't need to be said. It's fitting that both the Doctor and River are synced up here. No need for either to check their diaries. They know all they need to about their lover's life and history. So there are no blank spots, no questions that need answering. This is the perfect time to say goodbye. Uh, me, are you there? Uh, not Maisie Williams, but actually me. Are you there? We're losing our connection on this end, so <clears throat> I think you'd better wrap up the review from your end. Uh, and I'll see you all very soon when I'm him. <laughs> Jamie, set calls for Exotica Con. <laughs> I didn't quite make it, of course, but uh, I thought this was a very 
fun episode with a lot of surprising heart at the end. I give Doctor Who, the husbands of River Song, four toughnesses out of five. And this has been You Know Who Live. Yes, some of you have the right idea, thank you. Now, uh, we can go back to doing the Q&A. Oh, 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 I'm regenerating! Oh, oh, oh! Oh, I've turned back into Last Angry Geek. Oh my god. <laughs>